You found us through fly fishing. You'll stay for our passion and the community. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. Yeah, but he doesn't get it. How come fly fishermen don't get it? You only haul with the short power snap. Look for where people walk and the insides of bends and, and hunt those. The roof blew off and the interior walls got sucked out. And the trees are just coming up. And I mean, he's clearly not going to clear the trees. It is not a fly fishing story. It's a story about me trying to understand my brother through fly fishing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We've been waiting for you. Follow our guests, follow us on Instagram, and share this episode and the love if you enjoy this podcast. And we are live in three, two, one. How you doing, Colby? Doing great. Great to have you on here. Um, I've heard your name quite a bit over the years. We've had um, at least one episode uh, in your neck of the woods. Uh, we've had some folks, a lot of talk. I mean, I think you're in a hot spot again, you know, looking around the country. Um, and we're going to talk a little about the, the school that we're putting together with you and just talk trout fishing in general. Um, before we jump into that, everything with the school and kind of the fly shop, everything there, talk about how you first got into fly fishing. What's that first memory you have of fly fishing? Well, my first memory of fishing in general uh, with one of my grandfathers, just uh, lake fishing, literal cane pole, red and white bobber, couple split shot hook um, up at uh, Wintergreen Resort where we did some skiing in the wintertime. And uh, they have a bunch of lakes and ponds. And just remember catching my first sunfish. Every time that bobber went down, I got so excited. And pretty much from that moment on, every body of water that I saw, I was just curious as to what was in it, you know, what kind of fish were in there, what they would eat, how I could catch them, all that kind of stuff. So that just kind of perpetuated, got into conventional fishing in my younger years, and then eight or nine years old, got my first fly rod. I think I got a fly rod and my twin brother, Brian got a mountain bike <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I started fly fishing. He kind of made fun of me because he got a mountain bike, which he thought was way cooler. And one day he was on a trail. I was fishing a, a pond and he saw me actually catching fish and got off his bike. <laughs> and was like, man, that looks pretty cool. Grabbed the rod and caught a couple. And then he was, he was into it too. So fly fishing, you know, in some lakes and ponds around my house in, in Richmond and then up at up at Wintergreen, some fish and bass, like a a lot of folks on the East Coast get started into it. But at a very young age, um, you know, and just been eaten up with it ever since. Yeah, you've been going. And when did the what was the fly shop? How did the Mossy Creek, how that whole fly shop thing did? Was there a lot of uh, prep before that? No, not really. It was always, it was always in our minds, you know, through college and stuff, you know, kind of curious as to, you know, what we wanted to do, kind of always wanted to do something in, in fly fishing. Um, You know, Brian and I graduated from James Madison University. It worked in a fly shop while I was in college and um, had a, had a business opportunity. We both moved to Northern Virginia for, and while we were kind of researching that endeavor, had the opportunity to buy one of the fly shops in town and kind of thought about it. So as far as like prep work and everything, it was kind of a fly by the seat of our pants. Hey, let's move back and investigate this real quick. And, um, you know, kind of did it almost blind. It was that fast. We were you know, 10 months out of college, kind of put everything together. It was, it ended up being, you know, six, seven month process of finding the right location, getting our accounts together, uh, putting together orders, doing the, the store build out merchandising, stuff like that. But had, uh, lawyers and accountants 
and computer nerds in the family that helps get everything set up pretty rapidly. So <laughs> there you go. That's yeah. always good. Wow. Wow. That's uh, and, and is it you and your brother working together there? Who, who's on the, who's at the shop? So it started off, it was Brian and I originally, then we started hiring some guides and then as we kind of grew and built and changed locations and, and grew, added some staff members. So there's quite a few of us um, on the team now. So you'll find Andy. Andy and Nick are in the shop a lot. They're, they're also our instructors and do some guiding. Shane, uh, Bob, Tom, Jacob, Eric, those guys are on the water a lot. My brother uh, is on the water a lot in the summer. He does a lot of float trips. He loves being out on the water. And uh, I've got a few guys. Uh, Sam's one of our new instructors. And then Adam is uh, been helping us, doing a great job on on the weekends in the shop as well. So got a nice little team. Right on, right on. And we had, um, and I, I guess the, well, the connection, I think I heard about you out there quite a bit, but uh, Tom Sadler was on uh, quite a while ago. I think it was episode 98, which uh, was a few hundred episodes ago. But uh, I think that was the first time we kind of connected and heard about you guys. But, um, but so talk about that with what, um, you know, like talk about the school, because if you're putting these, we're going to put together this school. I want to hear what it sounds like for you. What is, what is the school? Is it high level, um, beginner? What's that look like? So we do a lot of education through, um, throughout the year, pretty much year round. If our weather is nice, we will go out. We do a lot of half day classes, you know, some folks that have a lot of fishing experience and background and want to transition from conventional angling over into fly fishing. A lot of those folks, they just need to learn to cast a fly rod and how to fish a fly rod and fish the different flies. And so that's usually a pretty quick, seamless transition if they can pick up the casting mechanics pretty rapidly. But we do a lot of full day schools and, and classes. We're the home base for the Orvis-based fly fishing schools in Virginia. We do a lot of schools at the different four season resorts, uh, Bryce Resort and Wintergreen Resort. And then just, you know, throughout the year, we just book them seven days a week when we're open. And we'll, a lot of those folks in those full day classes, a lot of them have never fished before, never touched a fly rod, never touched a, a fishing rod in general. And so we get folks from all different you know, backgrounds in the sport from not having much experience being in the outdoors in general. Um, then we, we do teach some high level casting instruction, you know, somebody's going to the Bahamas or Belize for the first time bone fishing or tarpon fishing. They want to add some distance to their cast, work on their double haul, things like that. We'll do some, some higher level instruction as well, but it's very satisfying you know, on the instructional side, it's something that a lot of our, our guides do as well. And it's a lot less pressure than, than guiding, you know, just sharing our information and knowledge about the sport and showing folks a good time. And then watching a lot of them progress into anglers. It's, it's very rewarding and it's, a, it's a lot of fun. It doesn't get old. Right. Where do you find like the new, if the people that are brand new to fly fishing, how do they find you guys? So we get word of mouth. Um, Orvis is big in the area. So there's a lot of corporate stores and then word of mouth going to shows, uh, being well connected and networked with a lot of the, again, the four season resorts. A lot of folks will go up there, they'll hear about fly fishing and then they'll, they'll find us. And so with just the, the high volume of schools and classes, that we do a lot of folks come to us for the, you know, their, their first time. And then, then they become good guide clients. A lot of times they want to, they want to go back out and focus more on fishing and catching fish and becoming more proficient anglers. And so they start fishing with us. Right on. What species are you guys focusing on there? I know brook trout is one popular species, but do you cover a number of species? We do. Um, very blessed here in the mid Atlantic for, the diversity that we have access to. So up in the mountains, mostly wild brook trout, 
some smaller, you know, wild rainbows and browns and, and different drainages. Spring creeks. So we have access to some spring creeks, which hold some larger trout. The state does a good job managing a lot of, you know, delayed harvest and special reg waters. So we have a lot of trout water around us. And then some really good smallmouth bass fisheries, the, the James, the Shenandoah, the Potomac, the Rappahannock, the New. So, you know, really good quality smallmouth water. Same with musky fishing. It's become popular, you know, in the last decade. Very good musky fishing. Uh, carp fishing, common carp in rivers, grass carp in some of the, the lakes and impoundments. And we're also, we're only, you know, three, three and a half hours from the Tidewater area, speckled trout, redfish, cobia, all the fun saltwater species. So you can do a lot of different things, you know, in, in Virginia and cover a lot of, a lot of ground. It's, it's a lot of fun fishing around here. Today's episode is presented by Jackson Hole Fly Company. Jackson Hole Fly Company is a new kind of online fly shop. They design and manufacture their own high-quality fly rods, reels, gear, and over 1,000 fly patterns. Right now, you can get 25% off your first order. Go to jhflyco.com slash swing to get started today. That's jhflyco.com slash swing. And if we were, you know, and we're talking about putting this school together, and I'm not totally sure. I mean, obviously, people listening now have some experience in trout, but there's also new people out there. What do you think would be a good, we typically put together kind of a, like, four nights, three days on the water sort of thing. What, what would that look like? Like, if you describe that school, you know, I, I think that, you know, we do a little bit of a school, and then we get out on the water and do some fishing. Uh, maybe talk about what you think that would be a good school kind of event to do there. Absolutely. So... We try to keep the classroom stuff to a minimum, just so people don't get overly, you know, bored. But there are some basics and some questions that need to be answered. Um, so we go through, you know, why we fly fish, you know, and why fly fishing can be more effective than other means of fishing at specific times. Go through basic rigging and knot tying so everybody can be proficient on their own. A big bulk after that is casting and making sure that folks not only understand casting mechanics, but it's very important that everyone leaves having the tools to be able to practice on their own. So we go through very specific casting and fishing clinics that allow everybody to take these steps home with them, start from scratch and progress each time they go out and practice. And that's probably the most valuable component of the school. Other than after that, everybody loves to get on the water and, you know, everybody's anxious and excited to go catch fish. Usually after you get some basic instruction and your, your confidence is up and you tie that fly on, and you're standing by the edge of a spring creek and you start casting, then you're hooked in the grass and in the trees and you don't know where your cast went because you're focused on the fun of, you know, the potential of catching a fish and you've lost, you know, the mindset of where you're supposed to be casting and how you're supposed to be casting or stripping your fly in and line control and all that fun stuff. So um, it's nice if you have, you know, multiple days, you can get your instruction dialed in, catch some fish, have some fun. If you start to develop any bad habits, we can correct on the fly, no pun intended, and then, you know, ease into the, the joy of just clearing your mind and fishing and kind of putting it all together. Right, right. So, and I, I'm guessing there's a little bit of, depending on the group, you know, some variation there. I'm thinking like if people are coming in, let's say they've got a little skills, they've done some fly fishing, but they're, you know, they want to, you know, especially for that area, want to get this dialed in a little bit. Let's just say it's brook trout. Um, it, how would that look? You know, so we do a little, I'm, I'm picturing a session where it's like the classroom session going through, like you said, some of the rigging and casting instruction. And then once you get on the water, maybe talk about that. Where might be we be fishing? And then how does that look as far as, um, you know, then are you fishing kind of like more like a guided trip then? Um, yes. Once they have the casting instruction, 
you know, fishing up on a brook trout stream. We've got a great one just west of town, Dry River. It's flat. It's big when it's full of water. And it's pretty easy to navigate and walk. You know, some people are very athletic. They can get right in the, the creek and start walking up and down. Some folks, we just have to give a little guidance on making sure they, they're not going to slip or fall in or injure themselves. But being able to spread folks out, if you've got some skill and it's springtime and the water quality is good and the, the, the temperatures are good and the fish are feeding, it's generally not hard to catch brook trout. They're mm. opportunistic. They're aggressive. You know, a fly hits the water, they usually come up and grab it. So what we end up focusing on is is drift and drag. You know, what will a, a brook trout refuse? Usually a, a wildly dragging fly. So we'll focus a little bit more on presentation while we're on the water and then setting the hook, stripping the fish in, proper release, that kind of stuff. And once folks, if folks grab the hang of it, you can say, hey, you know, go fish the next t- two pools ahead. And our instructors will be bouncing around, checking on them. They see somebody tangled up, lose a fly. They'll usually get up to them pretty quickly and help them out, problem solve. Then it's a matter of reading water, saying, if you're going to go to this next pool or this next run, where do you stand? How do you approach? Where are you casting to make sure you're not spooking fish, missing opportunities, that kind of thing. So you just the the creeks that we fish they're ever changing and so there's a lot of things you can discuss along the way but once everybody has good casting skills and good basic fishing techniques stripping picking up your slack if you're fishing a dry fly mending you know whether you're fishing a dry or a nymph or for pulling a little streamer where your rod tip should be stripping your fly in setting the hook different ways you just kind of go through that as they're walking through the paces and actively fishing. Gotcha. What well, what are some of the in that part of the uh, part of the world where you're at? What are some of the more famous, well known uh, rivers that people would maybe have heard of? So uh, maybe the Rapidan up in the Shenandoah National oh, yeah. Park, uh, the Presidential yeah, Stream sure, with. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's a popular one. It's a, a popular name stream. Uh, the Jackson tailwater, it's one of, you know, one of two of our tailwater fisheries that's a great wild trout fishery that's pretty popular. Mossy Creek is the kind of the blue ribbon uh, spring creek in the Virginia area. It's got close to four miles of water that's open to the public. So that one is, even in the drought scenario we're in now, you can still go out and fish trichos in the morning, grasshoppers in the afternoon and, and, and catch trout where a lot of other creeks are, are drying up or just not fishing well. So that one's a a classic or the namesake of our fly shop, but also the Shenandoah river itself, the, the warm water fishery. uh, It's been in a lot of books, a hundred places to fly fish before you, or 50 places to fly fish before you die. Um, the sure volume of, of smallmouth that exist in that entire watershed is, is mind boggling. 100, 150, 200 fish days. Um, when we start having 25 to 45 fish days, our, our guides are getting pretty upset and oh, wow. getting a little, a little uh, annoyed. Yeah. It's, it, it's where that spoiled most of the spring and summer and early fall. And then again, Dry River, I would say west of town. It's one of the larger, more densely populated wild brook trout fisheries in the mid-Atlantic. So again, a lot of diversity within 30, 40 minutes of the shop. Mm-hmm. And what is the, oh, you know, if somebody's coming in like time of the year to fish, is it springtime? Is that the best or are you guys fishing kind of year round? So great question. Uh, I would say for the 20 years uh, we've we've been guiding and instructing it's not so much seasonal as it is water flow related in our area. If we have good quality water flow, any time of year, our trout fishing is usually good. Now, we could have negative temperatures in the wintertime, or it could be 75 degrees on Christmas Day. So historically, springtime is the most popular time to trout fish, March through mid-June. 
I would say is kind of the peak season window. We've had years 2018 through 2021 where we had so much rainfall in the summertime. Our brook trout fishing in August was just as good as it was in May. You have fewer insects hatching, but the quality of the fishing was still as good as you would find in the springtime. So same with wintertime. If you've got good water flows and mild temperatures, our trout fishing just stays good. I gotcha. Okay. So yeah. So if we're setting something up, it really isn't critical. I mean, probably the springtime, at least that's a popular time, but we could, lots of variation here whenever we can put this together, it'll work. There is. And if, if, you know, it's generally our, our rainier season, but if our mountain brook trout streams get blown out, we always have our spring creeks. Uh, my brother and I fished Mossy Creek after Hurricane Isabel dumped 11 and a half inches of rain. <laughs> God, I heard about that. Yeah, between the two of us, we caught, I think, 70 trout on streamers. The the creek was out of its banks, running through the farmer's field, but behind every soft spot, there were a bunch of fish hanging out. So just one of those scenarios, it's it's very unlikely that we can't find a place to fish under even extreme uh, weather patterns. Gotcha. Yeah, I think for me, I think it would be cool to explore the different types of fishing, you know, if we're out there for a few days having, you know, maybe, you know, if there's some dries coming off. So like you said, it's springtime. When do, when do the first hatches, like big hatches, does that happen early on in the, the spring or what's that look like? Uh, Quill Gordon's uh, first first major mayfly. I mean, you've got your little black stones in the wintertime. You'll have some some caddis coming off and february and and even uh mid to early march on the spring creeks it's not as predictable but our caddis usually start popping but up in the mountains brook trout fishing everybody's always waiting for those first quill gordons and generally once your quill gordons have hatched april and may you've just got every two to three weeks you have you know different big major insect hatches occurring And so if it warms up early in March, it'll just start and it'll just be good. But last week of March, the entire months of April and May and into June, we've got a massive green drake hatch uh, Memorial Day weekend, historically, uh, even up in the some of our mountain streams. So start small ends ends pretty big with a lot of our mayflies. And then after that, after that, we're fishing ants, beetles, and little yellow stones in the summertime up in the mountains. Perfect. Yeah, there's a good variation. There's some stuff we can be doing. So depending, yeah, regardless of when we go, we'll probably have some some hatches coming off. And then do you guys also cover, like, the you know, nymphing, streamers? You, get, you cover a little bit of all the techniques? Absolutely. So, you know, you get a, a cold front. You've got high water, maybe a little stained water. We can definitely do some nymph fishing, especially up in the mountains. The spring creeks, usually again, some caddis in March, but if our water, if our water flows are high and the creeks are running a little chalky or turbid, we're doing a lot of streamer fishing. So, you know, in a, in a perfect scenario, you would go up and have some good dry fly fishing up in the mountain brook trout streams, maybe fishing a dry dropper so you can get a little, a little bit of uh, nymphing in. And then on the spring creeks, Regardless if it's big and dirty or if it's, you know, clear, usually in the springtime, our streamer fishing is excellent. So you can get a lot of really good um, instruction on your streamer fishing on the spring creeks anytime, anytime March through May. Okay, March through May. Perfect. So that might be timing that will work. And yeah, we just got off an episode recently with Chad Johnson and uh, we were talking streamers, you know, some of the big stuff they use. And yeah, I think he's a little way, but he's probably not too far from you. I mean, that he's fishing the White River. Um, but do you guys have you have some tailwaters there as well? We do uh, the Jackson and the Smith, but you know, high high dirty water anywhere around here, spring creeks or tailwaters, it's the you know same thing. Big flies and potential for some large fish or or big number days. Nice, nice, cool. Well. 
Uh, yeah, so I guess I'm just thinking, trying to paint the picture of this school and this trip that we're, you know, putting together. Uh, talk about the uh, the lodging. You mentioned a couple places. What what does that look like? Is are these like hotels, or are you doing stuff out of the? Um, yeah, you mentioned two of the places up there. Yeah, so we are in a college town uh, with James Madison University here. So we we've got no shortage of hotel options. There are some Airbnbs up along Dry River and then down along the uh, Shenandoah River itself. But most of the land around us is is farmland and actively working farmland. So a lot of our guests, there's uh, the Friendly City Inn, which is a bed and breakfast a couple hundred yards up the road from our shop. They do a wonderful job. And then we're also partnered with the Hotel Madison. And that's one. it's a privately owned hotel. It's on Main Street near most of the restaurants and bars and breweries. And they give our guests uh, good preferred rates. They do a great job. They've got a nice restaurant there and just a mile and a half from the the shop as well. So those are our two part, current partners and they've been doing a great job with us for a long, a long time. Perfect. And do you find like your, you know, customers, clientele that are coming in, is it mostly, you know, Virginia based people or people coming from around that whole region, you know, wanting to fish Virginia in some of these areas? I'm not totally familiar with all the the states and waters around you. Yeah. Um, we get people from everywhere. Our school that we did uh, on when, on Wednesday, we had somebody from Texas uh, that he was visiting up in uh, Indiana, I think, and then drove down just for the school. We get folks that will fly in, fly in from all over to to do some of the school stuff. A lot of our weekly clientele is Northern Virginia, D.C., Maryland, North Carolina. Um, two hour, we're we're two hours from D.C., two hours from Richmond. So folks can come and do a float trip or a full day trout trip in the same day without even having to stay over. So a lot of turnover or that stuff. Gotcha. Gotcha. This is good. Okay. And, and, and talk about the, you know, the fly shop a little bit. So um, how long have you guys had that open? 20, a little over 20 years now. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's been a long a while. Yep. Yep. Uh, this is our third location for the shop in Harrisonburg. So it started pretty small you know, 1800 square feet moved to after about five years, moved to 2,500 square feet and always looking for a place to, to buy versus lease in town. And then, um, had the, had the opportunity to buy the current location and, uh, make it our own, which was, uh, you know, tremendous benefit for, for everyone on the team. And, uh, it's been, it's been great. We've, Oh, I don't want to say we've outgrown it already. <laughs> I, I wish we had more space, um, but we're happy with it currently. And it's, we've been in there, I think seven years now. Okay, good, good. This is, this is awesome. And so what do you think has been the <laughs> the secret to your guys' success out there? You definitely, the word's been getting around. What, what's been, you know, any tips for other fly shops? How, how have you guys been so successful? I think it's enthusiasm. You have to be enthusiastic about all aspects of the business, you know, and it's been a lot of learning along the way. AFTA had some, you know, wonderful dealer summits in the past where I think uh, a lot of fly shop owners were like my brother and myself that didn't have a, a tremendous business background, certainly didn't have a background in, in merchandising, folding uh, displaying stuff nicely, the, the entire scientific process that goes behind a lot of that marketing has changed over 20 years. I mean, so you have to be excited about, you know, adapting and changing and, you know, learning constantly learning, you know, I, I, I became a lot of the, the folks on our team too, they're, they're excited to learn about, new merchandising techniques, how to display things in the shop. You get these pros that come in and they'll move stuff around and stuff that's been sitting there for weeks and haven't been looked at or touched. They can move it, put it in a different spot, display it a different way. 
and you sell three of them the same day and you're like this was not just coincidence this was oh, wow. there's yeah. there's a science behind it and once once you see it happen and work you got to start changing stuff and retail operations that good ones quality boutique operations they move stuff every seven to ten days a lot of times people come in that are your re- they're your regulars and they say when did you get this in and you're like well we've had that for six months <laughs> you're just <laughs> now seeing it because a lot of people are tuned in to go into the same spot getting their favorite flies Right. You know, or their their favorite tying materials and they're kind of tunnel vision. So you have to move stuff around and put stuff, you know, make it look attractive. And it's pretty remarkable. And it makes that that aspect of it makes it very fun because you you, you do have you, you can't let stuff sit there and get dusty. You got to be proactive and change, adapt and learn. Keep moving. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I think the uh I think looking at the uh, the police car, right, sirens and stuff, how that's changed. I mean, the same thing there. Like, people get used to the old thing, and if, if it doesn't change, then once you change it, you know, like, oh, okay, now they realize, wow, something's different. And that kind of goes with everything, right, including the fly shop yep. and, and just marketing and just marketing in general, right? Well, and, and also with the service side of things, most of our guides, when we hired them, we, we hired them as in, in, you know, shop employees first. And then we, we worked through with them over the course of about a year, how we instruct and they became instructors and they were ambitious and they wanted to guide and put people out on the water. And we had to kind of slow them down and explain to them that there's a lot of pressure on guides to perform and produce fish in various situations, scenarios with various skill sets and that instructing has a lot less pressure and a lot more enjoyment. And a lot of the folks that they would teach how to fly fish then wanted to go back and fish with the person they learned from. So they could work their way into guiding while they learned the waters extremely well uh, throughout different seasons, what to do. And the beautiful thing is, is you're not just typecast into a mold of taking people on trout fishing trips every day or just floating them down the same eight or nine sections of smallmouth water every day, you get to mix it up. You can get off the boat and you can instruct for two or three days, kind of have the pressure off, meet new people, see new faces, make new connections, and then go trout fishing for a few days and then get back on the river to smallmouth. So it helps with burnout you know, keeping guides from, you know, being jaded or seeing the same thing every day. And it keeps them fresh and on their toes too. And it, it just, the diversity there, the diversity of the work in the shop and everything else, you can stay busy and always feel like you're doing something kind of new and productive and it doesn't get stale. And I think that's very important in any, in any retail um, or service setting is to keep, keep things fresh. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a great tip for sure. So, so yeah, so it sounds like your people are doing a lot of diverse things around the shop and guiding and, and in the shop. What, what is, so if we had like, uh, let's say we're coming up for this school and we have like six or seven people coming along, um, what does that look like? Are we going to have a few, uh, instructors out there, a few guides, like talk, talk about maybe what you think the first day is going to look like and maybe the first couple days here. For instruction, Particularly, we keep a ratio of four students per instructor, typically throughout like the, the informational and the casting portion. Yeah. Usually once you get on the water, especially if you brook trout fishing and you're spreading out, usually two to one works best. We will guide folks trout fishing three to one, say it's a father and two sons. We won't make them pay for an additional guide. They just understand that their attention with the guide is going to be divided three ways. But when it comes to schools and instruction, if we have a school setting and we're out on some brook trout water or we're on the spring creeks fishing, two to one is a lot better. That guide or instructor can bounce between two folks running up and down the creek, Mm -hmm. you know, a whole heck of a lot easier than with with four people 
And so on fishing days, dedicated fishing and learning days, the ratio will be usually two to one. If there's a family and they kind of want to hang out together, that's fine. We can do three to one. But generally, that's how we would like to operate. Better personal, you know, uh, uh, attention throughout the entire experience just makes it better. Quick break for a word from our sponsor. With more than 40 years of experience in coffee, the Angler's Coffee Team roasts a full range of coffee with one goal in mind, delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. Responsibly sourced from farms using sustainable growing practices, you can rest easy knowing you are doing your part. Roasted and shipped within 48 hours to assure freshness. For me, it's all about that freshness and taste when I crack open a bag of anglers in the morning. I feel good because I know not only does it taste great, but I am supporting great movements along the way. With a blend for every taste, a dry dropper on the go tea bag option, and a roast sampler, you know Joe at Anglers is serving your needs. It's time to step up to better coffee and more impact for the fish species and causes we love. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash anglers right now to grab a bag of greatness today. That's anglers, A-N-G-L-E-R-S, to make a change today. And as far as fish uh, kind of species size, I mean, how does that look? I know brook trout are typically smaller fish, but do you have some areas where you've got larger fish, whether that's rainbows or brook trout or browns? Yep. So... Up in the mountains, typical, you know, five to eight inches is that's your classic eastern brook trout. They they do get bigger, 10, 11, 12, 13 inch brook trout exist. And we catch them regularly on, on some of our local streams. In our spring creeks, we actually caught a couple nice brookies in our spring creeks the other day. Uh, most of those are predominantly rainbows and brown trout, and they do get bigger the fish in Mossy Creek grow pretty rapidly. So up in the public section of Mossy Creek, the state supplements uh, what they call subcatchable browns. They're six to eight, six, seven, eight inches. And then they, they grow pretty fast. They grow faster in the Creek than they can grow them in the hatchery. So there's, you know, been, been very large trout caught historically in Mossy Creek uh, up and up and down, you know, the private water sections that we manage where we do a lot of our instruction and our guiding and up on the public section as well near some of the main spring sources. So 20 inch fish are not uncommon. And, you know, there's 24, 25 inch fish that that, that are available to anglers in, in a, a lot of our spring creeks. Okay. And these are browns or rainbows or both? Yep. Both. Both. Wow. Okay. And, and would they, if we were out there for three days, would we be mixing up, like maybe hitting, a, you know, up in the mountains for a day, come down, hit some of those bigger fish in the tailwaters? Would that be a, something, a good way to do it? Yeah, it's probably, probably mountain streams in the Spring Creeks. Tailwater's a little far away for us. Um, but if the conditions are ideal, I think it would be excellent to go do some, some you know, hone in the dry fly and nymphing skills up in the brook trout water. And then if, if there's good hatches on the spring creeks, you know, anything goes, but we could really hone in our, our streamer fishing skills and catch some bigger fish on the spring creeks. So the diversity there being able to do a day, the instructional day we'd probably do on our spring creeks, just because we have wide open grassy fields, spread people out, they can cast. And then we can walk right up to the banks, you know, manicured grass, cast, work on our our actual fishing technique, hopefully catch a couple fish, you know, that first day, get everybody excited, then put some waders and boots on, go up in the mountains, brook trout fishing, hone in the dry fly nymphing skills, and then go back maybe that third day and just punish the spring creeks. Mm, there you go. And and do you guys have, it sounds like, you know, if there's different skill levels, you guys can handle it. Like if somebody's got a little bit of experience, maybe they got to work on their casting or maybe dry fly fishing is a real struggle for them. That's something you can kind of focus on and really try to, what would you tell that person if dry fly, you know, that's always been a challenge. What, where do you start that person? It's interesting because in my opinion, dry fly fishing outside of potentially mending or, you know, line control in a brook trout stream, you're not having to make very long casts. And so it's some of the 
easier fishing to do. Put the dry fly in the bucket. Huh. Don't let the current drag it out of the zone. If you can keep it from dragging and you can manage your slack. So when the fish comes up and eat your dry fly, you can set the hook. To me, it's some of the outside of maybe swinging a wet fly, um, yeah. roll casting and swinging a wet fly and getting a grab. The dry fly fishing, usually pretty easy because it's visual. A lot of folks say they have a hard time nymph fishing. We get in, you know, the rabbit hole of the technicalities of nymph fishing and contact nymphing and euro nymphing and everything. Yeah. But, you know, a size 14 Prince nymph under a small strike indicator, brook trout fishing, again, it's like dry fly fishing subsurface. You watch the indicator and when it bumps, you set the hook and you either got a rock or a stick or a brook trout. And so it's usually pretty easy. The streamer fishing, I think, is usually the hardest with just the discipline of keeping the rod pointed at the fly, keeping it low. And when a fish grabs, you know, strip setting, like setting, you know, not lifting your rod tip and setting like you normally would and pulling the fly away from the fish. So I think the discipline of streamer fishing a lot of times, and also you're, you're moving the fly faster a lot of times and you're having to cast more. So I, I think streamer, we generally have more issues with folks properly streamer fishing than we do with dry flies and nymph fishing, but it's just sit Everybody's, everybody's different. Stand 15 feet behind the angler, watch what they're doing and then go up and solve one problem at a time. Right. Right. And that's it. And then what do you expect after a, a three day school like that, um, you know, after three days of kind of on the water, what is that person? Can you expect some pretty big changes like w with your casting and with maybe you're struggling with your, your nipping and, and technique? Well, not to toot our own horn, but if it, our typical one day class, if you cannot go out on your own and tie a fly on and cast and catch a fish, we haven't done our job three days it's just you're just compounding confidence day after day uh with adding skills to your set you know understanding again all the dip it, in the hardest part for most folks when they leave a school is what do i use what do i tie on i'm going to this creek i've never been to how do I approach this scenario? And every scenario is different. Maybe the water's low, maybe it's high, maybe it's cold, maybe it's warm. There's so many variables and that comes with time and experience on the water. But contacting your local fly shop, finding out stream conditions, picking out the right flies, you should have the skills, especially after three days on the water with that personalized attention you should be able to go and be confident anywhere you're going to go, you know, fish in freshwater for, for trout, especially if you're lake or pond fishing. You know, a lot of times we tell folks, find a pond close by, some greedy sunfish and some smaller largemouth bass for that repetition. You can work on your cast, but you can work on stripping, setting, stripping the fish in, releasing, starting the process over again. And that's that, that, repetition there is invaluable to accelerating in the sport and then just making yourself go out and do it time is our biggest enemy <laughs> yeah definitely free time so you're saying if somebody comes in and they spend a few days they're going to be have the skills to go out there and pretty much dries you know wet fly or whatever uh, nymphs and go anywhere really in the country and, and have a chance at catching fish they're going to have a really good solid base yeah it's right, up to them to it. practice it's up to them to practice beyond that take that rod out in the grass and 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 work on your on your drills your casting drills and your fishing drills for 15 to 20 minutes that's all you need and folks that have have done that have accelerated beyond you know their friends that have been fishing for 20 30 years they're like oh my gosh i got to cast better than i do i'm like well you fish you don't practice he practices and so he's getting a heck of a lot better very rapidly because he's really focusing in on actually getting better not just going out and having a good time and that's yeah, a big difference yeah. we see in a lot of folks is uh, attention it's just like any sport 
or anything that we do, the more you practice, the better you, the better you'll get. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and the practicing and what would be one of those things if you're out in your grass, what would be a casting practicing tip you would recommend something somebody could do? We have a very, uh, a very regimented um, three part casting clinic. And the first one is you actually cast out in front of you left to right. You don't take a traditional stance and cast over your shoulder. And it's so you can watch and learn how the rod loads under the weight of the fly line, mm-hmm. how to effectively stop the fly rod so your cast can unfold. And if it lays out straight on the grass, on your back cast, for instance, then you're going to initiate and do your forward cast. And it's a great way to learn not only how to cast, but how a fly rod can perform. We take new rods from manufacturers and we can go out and you can see how much line a fly rod can pick up um, and how far you can throw it with that very basic technique. And it allows the, the new angler to break the fly cast down into its most basic components. And then you just build off that. Our second step is a timing step. You don't allow the line to touch on your back cast, but you're still watching your loop unfold for your back cast. You're watching your forecast and you're watching your line lay out straight in both scenarios. And if it's not, then you go back to step one and you correct it. And then you go to step two and then step three, you, you take a, a traditional casting stance and you perform the same cast, making sure the fly rod is the tip of the rod is staying straight and in line, you know, throughout the entire process. And it really dials folks in. And so watching your cast, I would say, is the is the number one right. tip I would always yeah. I would always give folks. Turn and watch your back cast. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> That's a good tip. Nice, nice. Well, let's imagine we were doing like a uh, like a Zoom call or something in preparation for this, and we were going to walk through some of the modules, just high level. What would those be? You know, as far as the school, if we broke it down and said here, you know, put together like a course, what would be the you know, say the the ten modules? You know, you would have. You mentioned, I think, a few of them. You've of course got casting. You got rigging. Uh, what else would be under some of those other modules? Well, we discuss fly lines, you know, and in fly line weights, you know, why do we have mm-hmm. different weight fly lines? Well, to deliver different size or different weight flies and what are the tapers? It tapers and we have, you know, overcomplicated everything in this sport from gadgets right. and tools yeah. to to lines and leaders and tippets. I mean, there is there there is a a mousetrap for every possible <laughs> Uh, scenario that we've created. And so it's kind of bringing folks back to reality and giving them the information and tools they need to make quality decisions and gear purchases um, and where, where they're going to go and what they need. And so leaders in Tippet are always confusing for folks. So out of those modules, you know, not tying very basic knots, but the knots that you you must have how to you have to tie a fly on. It's part of fishing. Right. You don't have to repair your leaders and add tippet, but obviously a good choice. And so how to add tippet to a leader and the explanation of the size of leaders, just like the size of fly lines. So there's a lot of I wouldn't call it boring information, but there's a, there's a lot of technical terms and, uh, components that we have to cover and folks need to understand as part of those modules. Do we get into entomology and insects to a very, very small degree? We explain life cycles. This is usually a couple minutes, but you know, insects, what is a nymph? What what does it represent? What is a dry fly? What does it represent? What are streamers? What do they represent? Their purpose, why you should have a selection of flies versus one, why you need colors, that kind of stuff. So those are all kind of broken down into the the informational kind of components of the day. Yeah, so that's it. So you mentioned, I mean, basically the basic things are 
Of course, casting's a big one, but talking about the lines, but yeah, you got rigging, leaders, tippets, knots. You, that's kind of some of the basic stuff. You talk about flies. And then do you get into more, if you were doing like a, kind of a live Zoom sort of thing, would you get into breaking it down and have like a module on just dry fly fishing and break that down and then break down nymph fishing? Or do you guys talk about that together? How, how would that look? It's a lot easier, in my opinion, to almost do that on the water if you did it in a module like on a zoom again it would almost be like do it live on the water right you can show video snippets um, you can discuss kind of basically you know what you're trying to do with a dry fly how you generally fish them in a small mountain stream generally upstream or you know at an angle and then casting it up and then letting it drift back to you do you get as technical as talking about downstream presentations for dry flies? We do a lot of that on our spring creeks because of the challenging technical currents and stuff. But again, you could speak indefinitely on it's all situational, right? Where you are, what you're right. doing, what type of water you're fishing, I mean, dry fly fishing on the Henry's fork versus dry fly fishing in an eastern mountain stream you know there are volumes of books written on all of it and it's yep. making it simplified and accessible so most people when they're trying to learn fly most people don't try to learn fly fishing because they're intimidated by how much knowledge they think they need to have in order to go out and have fun and so it's again reining all of that in and saying fishing's fishing we just cast differently because the flies a lot of them don't have much weight to them and the fly line carries you know the payload to the target you're still a lot of times standing in the same spot you know approaching water the same way as you would with a conventional rod we just do it a little bit differently and it's more interactive and more fun and we focus more on that than the extreme technical aspects if people want to go down those rabbit holes we're, we're happy to uh, lead them down those but um from the instructional thing it's keep it light keep it fun keep it approachable and accessible and reasonable <laughs> right 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 yeah, exactly well that's a cool thing i think about this is then these are the, we've done these schools with some other folks and it's always kind of like, you know, the first step is like, what do you want to achieve? You know, what are your goals? Like any guide trip, right? Like, what do you want to get out of this? And I think you guys sure. can probably customize oh, yeah. that to say, hey, like, okay, this person has got their casting down. They want to focus on dry fly fishing, right? That, that's that sort of thing where even though we might have a diversity of people, we could kind of cover high and oh, low yeah. skill levels. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. Yep. We've got anglers all the time. They fish all over the world. They just love to catch smallmouth and, you know, all of a sudden we're like, hey, do you, you ever cast to a carp before? No, why would I want to do that? Well, let me tell you about <laughs> carp and how, right. how they're the most awesome fish yeah. that you can target with a fly rod. So same thing with, same thing with streamer fishing. I mean, or uh, sorry, trout fishing in general. You always learn from different folks that you fish with in different areas of the world, different rivers. There's always different techniques. There's always different flies, how to fish different flies. And so uh, with very experienced anglers, very rapidly, you can usually kind of dial in what they what they want to do for the day. And then you you always our our biggest things, Bob Kramer, who's been guiding in the valley for 36 or 37 years now. He, he always tells everybody, our goal is to ensure that everybody leaves a better angler with more knowledge. And, and that's just, that's the key to it. If, if you have somebody that fishes everywhere, just try to make the day enjoyable, but also you can almost always figure out something that they haven't seen or done before. Perfect. And what do you think Virginia, you know, is most known for? If you think about rivers and streams and kind of everything, like why... You know, people, you said some people are coming from around the country. What What do you think it is about Virginia? Obviously, it's got a lot of great history, but for fly fishing, what is it? Well, it's interesting. And if you look at social media and you see a picture of a really nice, beautiful trout, it always gets more likes than, say, a big redfish or a big largemouth bass or anything. It seems like m maybe a big tarpon 
could compete, but it always seems like the traction is trout fishing. But Lefty Cray, you know, lived outside the Beltway, you know, in Maryland, and he started fly fishing for smallmouth bass on the Potomac. And he frequented our, our spring creeks down here. But, you know, smallmouth bass just don't get the street cred that they, that they deserve. It's uh, out of all of our guides, they love trout fishing, but they would much prefer to float and catch big smallmouth all day, every day. But I would say that our brook trout is our state fish. We have over 2,200 miles of open public access brook trout water. It's more open access than any state on the East Coast outside of Maine. So we're kind of the stronghold of you know, mid-Atlantic or southeastern brook trout. And so I'd say trout fishing from a, a fly fishing lens is still the most dominant, um, yeah, it is. you know, side of the sport. But our saltwater is, is taking a lot of interest. Our musky fishing is, is very popular in our smallmouth bass population. There's some of the most hardcore anglers that we see are, are the big smallmouth uh, angler. So it's Love great. It. Yeah. The diversity is there, but trout always seem to win in the, in the fly world. <laughs> yeah, they do. They do. Well, I think it's kind of a, it's like the gateway drug, you know, the, the drug to get you in, right? The trout, it seems like you, once you get in, you do that for a while, it feels like everybody, you slowly evolve, just like you learn about conservation and you evolved in, even myself, you know, I've been oh, fishing yeah. my whole life, but I mean, now the salt water is really starting to have a much bigger appeal for me. Um, well, let's take it out here in our little, we've got a little segment, our listener shout out uh, Q and a segment here. And, uh, and the question, this one's presented by uh, Chota Outdoor Gear. Uh, they've got their new blue line waders. We're giving a shout out to ChotaOutdoorGear.com. Uh, but we had a question and we were in the Facebook group asking a question and somebody was asking about, you know, when you get to the river, I think you mentioned this a little bit, but, but you come to a new river, like what's the first thing you do when you get there to that river? What, like, do you just, uh, do you just sit there? Do you have any, do you have a, like a plan, any river? What do you, would you tell somebody? And, and we're going to give a shout out to Ra- Randy Taylor in the Facebook group. Yeah. No, it's all it's it's always exciting to go see and experience new water. I would say taking a minute to observe, you know, obviously every scenario is different, but look and see if there's an insect hatch. Look and see if there uh, are fish rising. Maybe go in to the creek and, you know, if you if you haven't rigged up yet, pick up some rocks, you know, look on the rocks, see, see what nymphs are crawling around. But a a lot of advice we give folks going to new water, if there's trout in there um, of any size, you know, maybe not just a brook trout stream, but just say a, a a general big wide trout river. You know, if you want to learn the water and explore, you can do that more rapidly swinging a wet fly or, or fishing a streamer covering water and moving and finding hungry fish. So a lot of times when I go to new water, I will streamer fish it, move around. Sometimes you'll spook fish. You'll start to see where the fish are in that river system. And you're going to cover, if you're nymphing a run, how many times do you cast in a big deep run? Well, if you're catching a fish or two, you might stay there. You might not, if you've got two or three miles of water you want to look at, you might only cover, you know, a hundred yards if you're nymph fishing and you're being successful. But if you really want to explore something, you can move around and cover water and see more terrain, uh, streamer fishing. Sometimes you'll run into a bigger fish that way too. Yeah. I love that. That's what Chad was talking about. You know, uh, we got into that a little bit because sometimes that comes up with the streamers, the question like, Hey, do you need a bigger fly to catch a bigger fish? And you hear both sides of that. But I think what he said was, yeah, I mean, when brown trout are over 22 inches, that's when they're pretty much eating big, they're eating fish. And so, you know, he likes the five inch to seven inch flies down there. And you know what I mean? So it's, it's interesting. Streamers and others, another one of those things for me too. I'm hoping to elevate my game. So what you're saying is you guys could help with some of that. If somebody wanted to dig into streamers, you could help the streamer game. Oh yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Good. Awesome. All right. Well, Colby, I think um, I, I feel pretty good about, I mean, anything you want to give a shout out on the school program or what you have going, you know, when we start to put this together so people have a better idea what they can expect coming in from probably around the region, around the country. I, I would just say we love instructing uh, everybody on the team. We're, we're excited to see new faces. We're excited to share 
our knowledge and our love of the sport and we look forward to every single one and we we just thoroughly thoroughly enjoy it it's what we what we live for is introducing new anglers to the sport and so it's it makes just a great experience for everyone perfect all right, Colby, well, we'll send everybody out to uh, mossycreekflyfishing.com. And uh, like we said, we're going to have some links in the show notes for people to get connected with the school program, and we'll follow up with that. And, uh, yeah, until uh, until we meet you in person, uh, thanks for all the time today, and, and thanks for all the great work out there. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the opportunity. That is a wrap. You can grab all of the show notes at wetflyswing.com. And please follow us on Instagram and share this episode out with someone you love. Please send me an email, dave at wetflyswing.com, if you have any feedback or want us to put together an episode on this podcast for you. Check in anytime. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and would love to meet up with you on the water. We have new fly fishing schools going all year long and all around the country, so if you want to connect, let's do it right now. All right, time to get out of here. I hope you have a great evening. I hope you have a great morning or great afternoon wherever in the world you are. And I appreciate you for stopping by and checking out the show today. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.